Hi, in this session, we're going to talk about student-led mortgages. A lot more people are looking to get a greater return on investment, and the student market is one of the sectors that they've been going into um, for the last couple of years. On my video, we're going to touch on your standard sort of buy-to-let that you've got some students in there, as well as more sophisticated type of HMO products for student lets. Hey everybody, hope you're well. It's Pyam here from Niche Advice. Let's talk about student mortgages, um, student let specifically. Um, there's quite a lot of information actually on the web uh, about student mortgages and there's quite a lot of interest out there um, where whether it's parents looking to, uh, you know, send their children to university and thinking, well, why am I saying, you know, why am I um, having to pay rent? Let me just get a buy to let and let the other students pay for it, essentially, and have my son or daughter live in one room. So there's that sort of concept. Um, I have to say that's fraught with all sorts of issues because what you will find that a lot of those people are not experienced landlords and explaining the concept to those type of products to them is quite difficult, I have I found in, in, the, in the past. Um, the more common type of inquiry that I get is um, landlords that are looking to get into student lets. Now, they could be first-time landlords, um, but they've got a different mindset to parents buying for their children. Um, they could be first-time landlords, or they could be next-time landlords, maybe have got a couple of buy to lets and now looking into getting into the student accommodation um, arena. Right, so let's talk about, in this video, I'm not going to talk about the parents stuff. I, I think we'll leave that to another video. I'm just going to touch on landlords looking to get into student lets. Now, student lets come into all shapes and sizes, but fundamentally it comes into two arenas when you're dealing with lenders. There's the, there's the stock, there's the properties that need um, a HMO license, and that there's a the stock that don't need a HMO license. Um, and generally the way the lenders view it is, look, if it's a three to four bed, then that's a normal buy to let, which is going to be let out to students, okay? And they've got rules to say, look, as long as there are, everyone's on the same tenancy agreement, so everybody's on the tenancy agreement, um, and you essentially meet the buy to let requirements, they almost treat it as a buy to let. So there are a number of lenders that will not give you, they won't ra raise your rates, for example, they won't put you on a specific uh, student let product, they will just treat it as a buy to let, but for someone who's got students in there. Now, that needs to be unlicensed, so it cannot be a HMO, and as far as I'm aware, uh, I most of those lenders would want it to be in your own personal names rather than limited company sort of transactions. However, there are a few lenders that will do the limited company transaction, okay? So, bits and pieces, and then it comes down to your own tax position, where you are yourself with your property journey, where you are in regards to your experience, um, certainly on a tax front, how how this will benefit you, and also structuring your own portfolio going forward. So, generally the smaller stuff, up to three to four bedrooms, uh, and the students will go in there. One thing I will say is, regardless of it, um, they would want a communal area. So you can't, if you're going to turn the living room, for example, into another bedroom, you need to have a communal sort of kitchen area that needs to be viable and large enough. So. You got that batch of lenders, so that's the standard. Then you've got the student lets that are up to six bedrooms, for example, on a couple of floors, and they're technically really a HMO. Now, sometimes the local authority may not treat them as a HMO, so they'll say, well, you don't need a HMO license. As far as the lenders are concerned, they will still treat them as a multi-let, and, and generally will put you on a HMO type product, a multi-let product, so that's really important. So. The difference between that than a normal sort of buy-to-let product that you can put students is, for example, it's not just the rate, which is often higher, or the fees are often higher, um, but also the level of experience. So I've had a client right now is looking to buy three different types of student accommodation. The first one is a three-bed, so no problem. We'll probably put that as a normal lender that will accept a sort of a buy-to-let on a student-let um, front. However, the, the th second one is actually a four bedroom, so again, similar, but the third one is actually going to be a six bed HMO. Now, six bed HMO, student let, that's doable. However, they are a first time landlord, right? Now, a lot of the HMO requirements, and I have done videos on HMOs, and you can probably check them out, I'll put a link up there, but 
uh, a lot of the criteria around HMOs and student lets means that a lot of the lenders that deal with HMOs would want a year's worth of buy to let rental experience. So they want you to be a landlord and have had at least another buy to let for 12 months. Some of them have got more, some of them will say two years, some of them will say you need to have a HMO. So the limit, the lenders that will lend to someone, to a first time landlord looking to buy a HMO for the first time, okay, and let it out to students, there are still lenders. However, that pool of lenders, the choice becomes narrower and narrower, okay? So, and then if you're looking to go, go more than six bedrooms, you're deemed to be a more of a professional um, landlord as such because, you know, eight bedrooms, 10 bedrooms and so forth. So the level of experience is obviously a, a requirement is greater. So there are all sorts of rules around it. You can get it as a first-time landlord. So you could be a first-time landlord. You cannot be, as far as I know, not have a property and get into it. There are ways where you can buy it on bridging finance and hold it and then refinance it. But that's quite risky and adds quite a lot of cost. So if you're a homeowner, I would say you can get into student accommodation, student lets, um, student buy to lets, whether it's treated as a normal buy to let, and there are options around that, to a more of a more sophisticated, more HMO or multi let products. Um, and like I said, the, the things around it is the difference between the lenders is very much around uh, your, you as a client, around the criteria of how many buy to lets you own, whether you've got any experience. And then you're looking at stress testing. Um, um, stress testing products for HMOs are harsher. Um, also, what you will find, if the lenders are going to treat it as a normal buy to let, okay, they're likely not going to treat the additional income that you will receive because obviously you're going to be earning more. They'll just treat it as a normal um, buy to let. So that's really important because if they're treating it from a criteria perspective as a normal buy to let, um, it's it's going to be deemed when the values go there, they may not say, oh, it's, uh, you know, you may achieve, I don't know, 1,500 pounds as a student let, but as a normal buy to let, it may be 1,100 pounds. The lenders, some lenders, some values will go and treat it as an 1,100 pounds rental rather than what you're actually receiving. So sometimes that's got to stack up and that's important. It's very important you go with a lender that's got experience within this sector um, and uh, the underwriters can make a uh, quick decision on this stuff because um, the, what you will find and uh, amongst the spectrum of the lenders that will lend, uh, there are normal lenders that buy to let lenders that are quite experienced. You've got the building societies that are lending within that arena. Some of them are very specialist. So you've got some lenders that do a lot of sort of HMO, um, uh, student led um, sort of um, uh, multi let sort of stuff. But there are some building societies that are your smaller traditional building societies. And what you will find with them is a lot. Um, a lot of manual underwriting, a lot of further questions um, because of the deemed risk involved. So um, it's not just about the rate, it's not just about the product fee, it's about the underwriting criteria, it's about where you are and how you fit into this. And one of the most important things of, of a broker is understanding where you are in your journey and how we can match you up with the right lender. Um, it, it, that's it's a real big skill and I, I think really that only happens with experience as people get more and more experience and deal with deals and, and mess up deals and learn from deals and deal with lenders and the deal with their underwriting problems and the survey problems and all of those things will uh, will be highlighted I suppose in a, in a lender uh, in a good broker's advice um, if you do uh, if you are interested in uh, in this sort of uh, sector do get in touch if you want to talk about finances I will leave a link to our uh, website there um, I hope you've enjoyed this one guys I'll catch you on the next one and like and subscribe as always thanks a lot the content of this video does not constitute giving advice it's purely for information purposes all cases should be discussed with a professional mortgage broker as a mortgage is secured against your home or property it could be repossessed if you do not keep up mortgage payments niche advice is authorized and regulated by the financial conduct authority